So um, uh, there is code on my web page, but it's a little bit outdated. And there's actually a couple of, uh, I mean, there's some minor mistakes with it that's really not a big deal. But there's a couple of uh, bigger mistakes on it. But I mean, it still seems to work. It generates numbers. Um, and uh, I mean, one of, one of the things is the computation of the gradient there. Um, it's missing a term. Uh, but it still seems to somehow work uh, in the sense that it converges to, to what seems like you know, reasonable numbers. Um, uh, but there's a couple of other issues um, with it. Uh, I've, I actually have updated code that uh, a student wrote, and I kind of keep going back and forth as to whether updated. But that's one place you can look at, uh, uh, at the code. Again, it's, it's a code, not the best code. I know that there's better codes out there. I know that um, um, Fox, uh, Sue, and Dubay, they actually have on uh, either on each of their websites or one of their websites, but they actually have a code for the, the MPEC algorithm. And I believe that part of, because they have for their comparison, they might also have kind of the, the BLP nested fixed point um, algorithm. Actually, if you really care, I'm sure someone can actually you know, Google them kind of during the talk, and I can update you later. But I'm pretty sure that there's actually, uh, for sure, code of MPEC. Uh, and they might also have the nested fixed point. And my guess is that their code, I mean, it's, it's, it's updated. I mean, they've written in the last couple of years. So it's probably more efficient and better the code that I have. And I believe there's a couple of other codes kind of floating out there. So if you kind of look, I'm sure you can find. Uh, most of them are either MATLAB codes or something of that sort. People are asking me, you know, when is Stata going to write a code like that? I don't know. Um, um, and I don't know, if, well, I don't know if they'll ever do it. And if they do, um, how good it will be. But uh, so there are things there. Now, they're usually for the kind of basic aggregate data. Stuff. If you want to add any of the micro moments, add you know some of the pricing stuff. I mean, you're going to have to do some of this programming yourself, and it's probably a good idea to do it anyway, not to just take. I know it's a little bit of a this kind of entry cost, but it's probably kind of um, um, uh, kind of worth doing. Um, but anyway, that's just in terms of code. Okay, in terms of um, uh, the topic, so I think you know Arlen and I decided that the kind of our last each of our last lectures will be on kind of much more closer to the frontier and stuff that we're currently working on, uh, or stuff that's more active and. Um, I was really debating on you know, combining some, some combination or some subset of four different topics. And at the end, I decided I'm just going to talk about one of them. And even that, I think I'm not sure I can fit in, uh, in an hour and a half. Uh, and I'll just mention the other three briefly, just in terms of I think these are directions that are active. And if you're kind of looking at, um, uh, at explore ideas or things to look at. So the three that I'll mention that I'm not talking about are, um, are instruments, um, relaxing the discrete choice assumption, and, um, and flexible models. OK, so let me just talk about each of these kind of quickly. In the issue of instruments, I think there's uh, two things or kind of two areas that are being looked at. One is the whole issue of kind of weak instruments. Uh, and that relates a little bit to the computational problem. I kind of mentioned that briefly. Uh, personally, I think, but again, I'm biased because it's, you know, uh, it's my paper that I'm going to refer to. But uh, personally, actually, I think the whole exploring the whole issue of invalid instruments or inference with invalid instruments um, uh, is an important issue because, you know, as you saw when we got to talk about instruments, you know, you guys pushed me a little bit, you know, rightfully. Uh, and, you know, there's only so much that you can say. You say, well, you know, that's the best we can do. Yes, there's issues with them and stuff. So, um, so an alternative approach that I actually took in a paper that's just forthcoming now in the Review of Economic and Statistics, Restat, um, with Adam Rosen is to say, well, what happens if instead of having a moment in quality, we have a moment inequality. So we say there's a, as an instrument Z, but it's actually correlated with the error term. Can we still say anything? And it ends up that you can actually, um, uh, you can set identify, so kind of building on the ideas that uh, Ariel just talked about, you can actually bound the parameters. Uh, and in some cases, the parameters, can, the bounds can be uh, reasonable. I mean, we haven't actually got to the point, maybe because we haven't employed a lot of instruments, we haven't got to the point we have a point estimate, but we actually get the intervals are what I think might be useful. Um, uh, for some of the stuff that we looked. But we've only looked in the case, and even though we set up the model, the problem in general, we only looked at the linear case, which means we only looked at the logit uh, models. And we literally actually used some of the serial um, uh, numbers that I showed you earlier to say, let's go back and explore what if these prices in other cities are indeed correlated. So that's one area that I think that we can actually do a lot of work with, whether it's kind of finding ways to find better instruments or working with these methods or something, uh, uh, an alternative. The other method, the other issue, um, or the second issue is the issue of looking at um, choices that are not discrete, either because we have multiple choices um, or because we have uh, issues of a, a, a multiple plus, a, you know, a discrete choice and then a usage decision. So, for example, Ariel kind of uh, 
uh, in the previous lecture, just briefly alluded to the issue of, let's say, if you look at uh, air conditioning, right? So there's a decision or appliances in general. Which one do you take and then how much do you use it? Right? So there's this kind of old um, uh, paper by Dubin and McFadden in 84 in Econometrica. Uh, but in some sense, that's kind of um, almost begging to be kind of, you know, quote unquote, updated or kind of reused in this kind of new uh, generation. And then there's other choice situations where we actually see people choosing more than one option. Right? So we kind of know it's like, well, you choose one. But you can think, well, what would we do if we actually see people choosing you know, three options? Or what do we see if we see people choosing you know, um, a number of options to satisfy, let's say, a budget constraint? So you know, I have you know, $10, or you know, I have a cart that I want to fill if I'm going to a supermarket. I'm going to buy up until that's full. Right? And it could be maybe full after two items, or it could be full after 10. Right? So these are actually, I think, problems that you know, uh, there has been some work on, but we could probably have more. And then finally, the issue of um, uh, flexible demand, I think um, uh, I just briefly alluded right, to the results of Hale and uh, variant Hale on identification of non-parametric models, which we probably you know, uh, maybe could have actually spent more time actually going through the results. Um, but I think a very interesting follow-up is not just identification, but then trying to connect this to estimation and talking to sort of, you know, because as we saw, it's very important to try to get these flexible functional form and try to get, you know, the, the um, the, uh, the right kind of demographics or the right kind of um, uh, uh, unobservables, but then also say, well, what's the distribution that we want to put on that? How important is that? How can we really try to uh, um, really get more flexible functional forms to get at this? And I think that it's kind of it's a ripe area. And I think you know, different people have kind of been uh, approaching it from different, uh, a different way, a lot of it using kind of more uh, household level data. I know, you know uh, Stefan Holderlein's here. I mean, he's kind of done some work on this kind of with other data set, but it's kind of a prime for some of those ideas to actually come in, um, uh, come into this literature. Okay, so that's kind of a third area that I'm not going to be talking about, but one that you know we probably could have spent at least one lecture on. Instead, what I'm going to be talking about um, are um, issues of dynamic demand. Okay, so let me just kind of start uh, from motivation. So up to now, you know, we've um, we focused on static demands, although it was kind of very clear um, that you know dynamics are in the background. You know, both on the demand and supply side, but I'm just going to focus on the demand side. Now, right? So if you talk about cars, you know, obviously cars are durables, right? So before lunch they weren't, after lunch they, they became durable, you know, suddenly. But uh, uh, we talked about, you know, cereal, well, it ends up, um, cereal is storable, right? So if you buy in one week, it doesn't mean, oh, you have to consume it right then, right? Now, some of the stuff we saw was actually, you know, uh, was over a quarter. So you say, okay, if you buy in one quarter, maybe you're going to consume it over, and maybe some of these issues don't exist, but we'll see that's going to bring, um, um, that's going to bring that in. So more generally, you know, dynamics can arise in demand for different reasons. You know, I talked about storable, durable, but you can also think of habit formation. It could be that you know, what I purchased last time is going to impact what I do today. Right? There's some sort of switching cost. Right? If you're thinking of, uh, I don't know, uh, which cell phone providers or you know, which uh, telephone I use or maybe, I don't know, loyalty to an airline. I mean, you can give uh, all these um, uh, examples, right? So it's either you know the habit formation or switching costs. There might also be some learning, right? On the other end, where the new product is introduced, it takes a while until you actually learn the characteristics, right? In the model, we always assumed you know what they are almost instantaneously, and you want to maybe learn, you know, um, you know, you, you learn as they go along, right? So a new product is introduced, maybe it takes a while for the consumers to actually figure that out, and that might be important if you're doing the um, uh, the welfare from a new product. Right? It could also, you know, it's not even clear which way it could go. Some products you might say they're not buying it because they haven't learned about it. Some product could be exactly the opposite. You may be, you know, for cheap products, I don't know, there's a new, yog a new yogurt available on the shelf. You say, oh, let me try it, right? So there's this big jump initially, and then people try it and they don't like it, and it sort of goes down, right? So you have to be a little bit careful about these things uh, when you're going to estimate um, uh, demand and use that for, let's say, evaluating the welfare gain. So I'm going to focus today on storable and durable goods. And there's a lot of different ways that I could uh, address this. What I'm going to try and really focus is on uh, three things. One is to say, what happens um, to static estimates if dynamics are present? Okay, what goes wrong? Right? And I'm going to try to talk both in terms of uh, you know, our estimates sort of biased in which direction, but also kind of think in terms of modeling, what parts of our model are, are kind of are missing. Right? And I'll kind of try to point that out in different parts. Then I'll talk about various models of estimating dynamics, so the challenges of estimating dynamics and the way that the literature has tried to, um, to, uh, to deal with it. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about estimation with consumer and aggregate data. Here I'm not going to go into the level of detail that we've gone in the past, so I'll just quickly talk about some of the methods, um, but I won't really go to the, you know, the level of detail that we've gone in kind of other, other lectures. I just don't have time. 
Okay? Um, so that's um, this last point. Okay, so let me kind of, before um, going to the specific, let's just kind of mention, you know, the challenges in estimating demand. So we've already, we've already seen this, right, even when we talked about uh, static demand. The, you know, one of the key issues was this kind of too many, um, uh, too many product or too many pr parameters problem. Okay, too many product, too many parameters problem that we, um, uh, we had to deal with. And the way we, in static models, the way we solved it is we basically took the product and projected them on a characteristic space. Right? So we said, okay, we start with you know, J, where J is a large number, maybe 100, and projected them on, let's say, K characteristics, or K could be you know, 5 to 10, uh, in most cases, sometimes not even that. Actually, usually the challenge is to find enough meaningful characteristics, not the other way around. Okay? Um, now, for dynamics, if we want to do that, um, at least without kind of putting any more structure, that's still not enough, because now what we need to do is we need to keep track Right? So if you say, you know, I'll be much clearer about this in a second, but if you're thinking, I'm now going to make a decision, and my decision depends not just on today's characteristics, but also the future, I now have to form expectations right, about all these characteristics of all the products, right, what they're going to be in the future. Right? So that's a lot of things to keep track of. Right? And the most general thing is, right, even if, suppose I just have you know, price and one characteristic. Right? But I have a lot of products, I now have to sort of keep track of what's going to happen to these in the future. Right? So I need a way to somehow reduce um, the state space. Now that's even, you know, um, even harder because that's going to be interacted with consumer attributes because different consumer might care about you know, different things differently. Right? So when I kind of have to form kind of this, um, um, uh, this expectation about different things, it's going to be, you know, it's not like I can just say, oh, let's just take, you know, some sort of a, a single a index. I have to kind of figure out how that's going to interact with um, uh, um, the different consumer attributes. So it's really not practical, and I need to somehow reduce the dimensions. So I'm going to sort of show basically, um, I'm going to call it two different solutions. I'm going to talk about three different papers, essentially. Two of them in storable goods and one in durable goods. Um, one of the storable goods, one of the durable goods, take a very similar approach, different, but I'll try to kind of highlight how it's different, but a similar approach um, uh, to it. And then there's a, another kind of this, uh, you can see up there, kind of the simple, uh, uh, simple demand model for storables, which actually is going to take a different approach to trying to simplify the problem. Okay? I don't think any of these is kind of the latest word on the topic, but that's kind of, or might be the, the latest word, but not the last word. Uh, I think there's a lot that we can do, and you can see there's going to be a lot of strong assumptions here, but you know, we need to do something to make some progress. Okay, so let me start with storable goods, and let me just kind of set up the problem. Um, so this is a typical pattern um, for when I say storable goods, but you know, think of goods that you buy in a supermarket. Okay, so that's what I have uh, in mind. So this is actually a price graph in one particular store um, uh, over a year for um, the price of a, I think it's a two liter bottle of Coke. Okay, but you can actually produce, and there is in the literature kind of for, you know, a whole bunch of different products. You'll see the details differ a bit, but it's all kind of the same idea. You have a regular price with occasional price reduction going back to that same regular price. And occasionally you see the whole plateau shift, but this is kind of a pretty common, uh, a common pattern that you see across you know, many different store formats, different, uh, different countries, um, uh, and different products. Okay, so that's, um, uh, that's the pattern. So seeing this pattern, I think you know, I'm going to ask, uh, um, Two different questions. Okay, one which I'm just going to ask now and not really address, but I think, you know, to me it's sort of two different questions that come up. One is why do we see this pattern? Okay, and the second, then I'll answer kind of on the next slide, and that's going to be the focus is how do consumers respond when they see it? Okay, so even if we take this pattern as given, say we don't understand, you know, where it's coming from, the question is what is it doing? Okay, so, you know, if you see this pattern, you could say, well, one thing is say. Maybe, you know, it just ha it so happens that if you go to our pricing equation that we had before, the, Nas the static nash bertrand it just so happens that the price and demand condition changed that this was the statically optimal price. Theoretically, that's possible. It's hard to imagine that, you know, the conditions would be such that it will give you exactly this distribution, but, you know, it is theoretically possible. So that's uh, option uh, one, although I, I highly doubt that's the case. More uh, kind of more serious uh, attempts at addressing this go back to a paper by Halvarian. Uh, so I guess Halvarian is a motivation for both of our uh, lectures this afternoon. So um, uh, in a paper where basically, um, I can go into details, but there's kind of two types of consumers, consumers that uh, know about prices and those that don't, or consumers that are loyal and those that are not. Um, and stores are basically uh, competing between them, and the equilibrium involves having a mixed strategy. 
And the mixed strategy basically say sales are a function of the mix are, are basically the, the mixed strategy. So they're randomizing between the regular price and the uh, and the sales price. And there's um, uh, so there's some appeal to this theory. In particular, it actually gives you some randomness that we see in the sales, right? It didn't maybe didn't look as random there, but at other series it does look a little bit more random. Um, but it has some problems. Um, uh, in particular, it actually should be if it really is a mixed strategy, it should be the there should be no state dependent, right? So whether you had a sale last period, it shouldn't depend. It shouldn't impact the probability of a sale today. You're basically tossing a coin, the same coin every period. And when you look at data, there is some state dependence. So in most cases, if you had a sale previously, you're less likely to have it today, and that's not as consistent with this um, with this theory. Also, this theory, at least the the strict version of it, says you should see a continuum of prices and not a two point support. But there's ways to kind of modify the original paper to actually get the two point support. Um, another story that people have proposed is multi-category pricing. So the idea is that you actually have a sale to bring people into the store, so they buy other products. Um, uh, that's probably part of the story, but it's hard to imagine that it's all of it. Um, and then the final theory, which is kind of my, um, uh, my favorite and the one that we're going to kind of build on to try to um, um, look at when we go to demand, is intertemporal price discrimination. So the idea is that there, people differ and um, in their price sensitivity, but also in their ability or willingness to store. Okay, so there you can think of there's people who store and people who don't store. Okay, and the idea is that you want to separate these two, and what you're doing with the, with the sales is to basically intertemporally price discriminate. Okay, so there's kind of a, a, an older theory literature, uh, starting with Sobel, actually looked, this was in durable goods, but had kind of the same sort of idea of intertemporal price discrimination, um, uh, and several more uh, recent papers. Probably the latest one is uh, uh, Eagle Endel and I have actually a working paper um, that kind of uses this, the next model I'll talk about and closes this and actually literally shows here the profits, the welfare gains that you can actually get, well, the, the profits and the welfare implications of this um, in the temporal price discrimination. Okay, so that, you know, that's in terms of the sale, just to supply side, just to kind of get this out of the way. For the rest of what I'm doing, I'm just going to say sales are there and let's just see um, um, what implications that has for demand. Okay, so for today's talk, I'm actually not going to close the model. I'm just going to focus on, on demand. So um, um, I guess here what I need to, wanted, to, wanted to say is why do cons uh, uh, what do consumers do when they see their price? And I think the answer is they store, right? So the idea is the product goes on sale, at least some consumers. The product goes on sale. You say, hey, why wait till next week? Let's buy it today. And there's a lot of you know, different evidence here that I kind of uh, uh, talk about both in the economics literature and in the marketing literature, but instead of kind of surveying this kind of in a dry way, let me show you, I think, the one table that at least, you know, for me kind of really, you know, drove things home, okay? So this uh, is a table looking again at two liter bottles of Coke, um, and um, what we have here in each cell is the average unit sold in a week, right? So kind of average number of bottles sold in a um, in a week, I believe this is actually average over kind of several, several stores. And uh, first, what we have um, uh, in the different uh, rows is we look at periods that are sales and those that are not sales. Okay, and how do I define those? Um, you know, just go back, look at that you know, picture. I think it was very clear what was sales and what wasn't sales. So if you look at kind of the margin there at the end, you can see once I have a sale, I sell significantly more than when I don't have a sale. Right? And even though, you know, I mean, those sales were fairly large, but still, I mean, you look at the quantity that, you know, how much it jumped up, it jumped up, you know, it's almost tripled during periods of, um, uh, of sales. Uh, so that in itself, I mean, it's, well, interesting to see that, you know, economics work, people respond to price, but not, not surprising. Uh, what's interesting here is if I condition on what happened in the previous period, right? So I look here as to whether there was a sale in the previous period or uh, was a sale or not, okay? And you can see, um, uh, already kind of here, uh, you know, if you look at the margin, you see that there's a fact, but this is actually conditioned also on today's factor. And you can see holding today's price or today's state constant, you can see that I sell less if there was a sale yesterday. Okay, and similarly, you know, this, uh, sorry, yeah, this was no sale, and this is in the case of a sale. Okay, so there's actually a significant effect of how much you sell on a sale or how much quantity you sell during a sale depends on whether there was a sale in the previous period or not. Okay? Now you might say, oh, you forgot, you know, there's omitted variables, so this is Coke, but you say, well, what happens if actually uh, Pepsi is, uh, 
is omitted, and it's exactly kind of the opposite. So what happens is, in, you know, if in these periods, it's really just about Pepsi having a sale. That's what you're selling. That's, that's not it. I can actually show you this table conditional on whether Pepsi has a sale or not, and it actually even looks nicer. Okay, but uh, that's not what's driving it, and you know, later we'll actually see if you do this in regression and control for a bunch of other things, that's not driving it either. Okay, uh, and by the way, if you're wondering whether these differences are significant, I have the standard errors in there for you. You can see they're actually fairly small. So the differences really are um, significant. Okay, so to me that sort of says, all right, it seems like consumers are storing, and before we go and try to model this, we might ask, well, suppose they do, then what are the implications for everything that we've done up to now? Okay, and um, so when consumers store, we have to realize that there's, um, there's two things. First is that the purchases that they buy, okay, so what, what I see people purchase is different from what they consume, right? So there's a separation, so purchases both can go to consumption, right, and to storage. In a static model, they're the same, right? There's no difference between them. But here, you know, it could be that I'm buying today because I want to consume tomorrow. Right? And that's going to be sort of a key, um, uh, a key issue. And our object of interest, what we really want is, you know, ultimately if you want the preferences or, you know, you can think of it as the consumption function if you want. Right? I basically want to know, right, if you think of it, I don't, want to, I don't want to use the term demand because demand's confusing what I mean purchases or consumption. But uh, what I want to know is given people's preferences, okay, if I take people's preferences and then ask, you know, give them a set of prices, how much would they consume? Right? So how much if they would, they would buy if they were only buying for today? Because for most applications, that's real, or if we have that, we can then do different things. But for mostly what we care about, we want to know some long run effect. Right? So what we want to know is not necessarily the response um, to a one week sale. Right? If we're in marketing, we care about that. But in economics, I think we care more about long run effects. Right? So we say, what happens if now you know, Coke merges with another, uh, another producer of soft drinks and you know, what would, be the, what would be their incentives to raise prices, okay? And what would be the long run effect, right? So um, you might also say if you, you see that pattern, you might want to say, you know, are they going to have more or less sales? But that's kind of a separate issue, right? If we just look at a kind of static supply model, right, it's a different type of incentive. So there's two separate issues with uh, static demand estimation, and it's important to separate them. One is just a pure econometric bias, right? Um, and you might sort of say, well, there's some omitted variable that's maybe correlated my, with my price sensitivity. Okay? But I think more important than that, I, I actually think thinking about this in a kind of, as an econometric bias in some sense is not the right way. Really, what we want to think about is that there's a difference between short run and long run response. Right? So even if there's no bias, even if we have no econometric bias, that we're getting the right coefficients, um, we want to separate between how consumers are going to respond if there's just a temporary reduction to price versus a long run reduction to price, right? It's, uh, it changes, you know, we change the price for a long time. And the static model can't really give us that separation. And in most applications, as I said, we really care about the long run response. And so the problem, I think, you know, with static estimates is it kind of it combines these two, right? In some sense, what it gives us is, it's not even clear, it's not really giving us not short run or long run. Okay? But if we ask, well, what's the static, you know, if, suppose we do the static estimates and use them to compute some elasticities and pretend as if they're long run, um, how would they compare to long-run responses that we would get from a dynamic model? Okay, and I'll actually confirm this later when we do the estimates, but you could ask here. So it ends up that if you do that exercise, right, you go and estimate a static model, and then use the same data right, with these kind of sales, right, and estimate a dynamic model, what you should expect to get, and that's what you actually get when you do it, is you get that the static estimates overestimate the own price effect. Okay, so you're going to get sort of um, that people are respond more to price, are more price sensitive from the static estimates than what you would get from a long run dynamics. And the intuition for that I think is pretty simple. What we saw there is we saw that there's a huge response to sale, right? Sales kind of really spike up. Uh, quantity sold spikes up during sales. Now the static model attributes that to people are very price sensitive. You give them 20 cents less and they're going to buy a lot more. The dynamic model realizes that a lot of that is really just people buying today for tomorrow's consumption. And if you basically reduce that price permanently, right, kept at that level permanently, people, that effect wouldn't be there. Right? So it could actually be the situation where maybe people are not price sensitive at all, right? in the sense that if you reduce by 20%, they're not going to increase their consumption. Okay? You can imagine some goods that, you know, I don't know, think of laundry detergent. You might say, you know, people say I have to do the laundry. It's not like they're going to do less laundry 
if you actually increase, uh, reduce the price. Okay? But you might, you still get this big response to sales. Right? So that's kind of the, the own price effect. What's interesting is that the cross price effects are actually tend to be underestimated. Okay, so static demand estimate, and actually what, what we found in a lot of our, uh, a lot of the papers, that's actually a bigger effect than the own price effect. And that's one that, you know, it's actually when we first found it, we were a little bit kind of puzzled by it, and uh, we almost thought it was a mistake, but it's, uh, the more you think of it, it kind of makes, um, makes sense. Um, and a lot of the terms I use here might make more sense later once you see it in the model. But basically what happens when you can store, right? So think of, um, uh, uh, think of you know, demand for, for Coke, right? Where the alternative is Pepsi, okay? That's a competing product. Now, if you can store Pepsi, the relevant price is not Pepsi's price today, right? It was Pepsi's, you know, it could have been Pepsi's price yesterday or two weeks ago, whatever it is, it, right? So there's an effective price, the price at which you could have bought the product, right? So what that means, right, that this effective price, think of it as, you know, some minimum or some function of the whole history of prices, that's the relevant price. And the price today is not relevant, right? So if you just stick today's Pepsi's price in there, you might think, oh, they're not responding, right? So you look at two periods, one where there is a, a Pepsi sale, one in which there isn't, you say, oh, it's not impacting Coke's quantity sold at all, right? But the reason you think it's not impacting, it's because, well, there are peop you know, some people have already bought it in the past. Right? Because today, you know, in some sense, think of it almost like a measurement error problem, right? You don't have the relevant price, and you're kind of attenuated towards, um, uh, towards yours. That, not quite right, but that's kind of, I think, intuitively what's going on. Okay, so let me go now. So that's, that's what we expect would happen to the demand estimates. Um, and now let's go and sort of say, okay, suppose we, you know, you've convinced us it's important. Okay, what do we do now? So let me actually propose a model of consumer um, stockpiling. I'll go through some of these details of the models. Uh, the key thing that I want to uh, get from here is to actually show you what are the challenges and how the literature is, um, uh, uh, has gone around this. Um, uh, and as I said, you know, some of these ideas, I mean, I'll show you how they, they work in durable goods markets, but people have used it for other examples as well. Okay, so we're going to start here um, um, from the utility of the consumer. So this is the utility the, uti the consumer gets uh, from consuming uh, at time t. Okay, so that utility is a function of CT. CT, um, here just to emphasize, everything with an arrow on top is a vector. Okay, and I'll, because one, one of the big challenges is going to be how to reduce the dimension. I'll show you that later. So I want to emphasize, you know, when things are vector and when they, in some sense, you know, stop being a vector of, of, after different assumptions. So the utility from consumption there is the utility for consumption from all the J products. Okay, this is a J, uh, a J dimensional vector. Um, and these uh, VTs or uh, uh, new Ts, which are just shock to consumption, right? So it's going to change your marginal utility from consumption, therefore changing how much you consume, consume each period. Plus um, uh, here, MT is a numerator, you know, multiplied by some uh, marginal utility of, um, uh, of income, right? So this is kind of all the other goods. Okay. The consumer's choice is the following. They're going to have to choose how much to consume, which brand to buy. So I'm going to still let the purchase just be of a... Um, uh, of a single option, right? But an option, I'm going to say, is both a brand and a size. And I want to kind of make that clear because that's going to play a role later. So there's a question of not just, you know, do I buy Coke or Pepsi, but in some sense, how much, you know, what size of them do I buy, right? That's going to be the decision. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to have my uh, uh, discounted expected flow of, um, uh, of utility, and that utility is going to be the utility from consumption minus some cost of storing inventory. And again, at this point, the inventory here is going to be a vector because I have an inventory of each of the brands that, I, that I'm solving. Plus, I'm going to have these terms here, which are basically what we've been seeing for the last, you know, the last day and a half, right? So this is going to be the utility, if you want, what we call up to now the utility from, um, uh, from consumption, uh, from purchase, sorry, plus the epsilon. Okay, so kind of take away this sort of first part, and that's basically what we've had up to now. Okay, and I'll kind of, I'll talk a little bit more about what this is doing and what we're trying to, to get here. And we're going to maximize that subject to the following constraints. First, inventory can't be uh, negative, uh, as consumption can't be negative either. Choice is going to be discrete. Okay, one of the X's, one of the size here is, this, is a zero size, so not purchased. So I'm going to buy exactly, um, uh, exactly one option, right? Where one of the options is not purchased, so just exactly as we've had up to now. And this is the... Um, uh, transition of inventory, okay? So basically each 
component by component, what I do is I take the inventory I had today, plus whatever it is that I purchased, if I purchase, and that's whatever the size is, minus whatever consumption I had. Okay, so fairly straightforward. Okay, in terms of the stochastic structure, so there's um, basically three components that I need to tell you about. One is this epsilon, right? So it's gonna be just like we've always assumed, it's gonna be an IID extreme, uh, um, uh, extreme value type one, okay? So just kind of the logit error term. Um, second is these consumption, uh, these shocks to consumption. And I'm gonna assume that, you're just gonna assume that they're IID over, um, uh, over time and across consumers. Um, both of these, by the way, we can relax if you want, you know, the epsilons or these Vs to be correlated in principle, but it becomes a computational nightmare. Okay, so from a practical point of view, relaxing these, I mean, we can maybe do it a little bit, but not much more than that. Okay, the final uh, component, I'm going to assume that prices and advertising are going to follow a first order Markov uh, process. So uh, I think there are two assumptions here. One is the fact that you know, it's, it's, a, it's a first order process. Uh, allowing for higher orders is actually not that big of a deal, and I'll, I can show you later. Um, what's actually not on this slide, because it's something that's not sort of important now, but I am going to assume that this process is going to be um, um, exogenous. Exogenous in the sense that uh, um, you know, firms set it and it's not responding to stuff in the model, right? And, and that, you could say, well, you know, we've been talking for the last day and a half about endogeneity and how to deal with it. I'll show you later how we deal with price endogeneity. But one of the big differences, by the way, between, you know, this literature, um, at least kind of this first part, I'll get back to it kind of later, um, and, um, and the static stuff is really, you know, the, the discussion or the emphasis put on endogeneity, right? So here endogeneity is dealt in a very different way, but I should emphasize the data structure is also a little bit different. Okay, so I'll kind of uh, get back to this when I talk um, uh, uh, later when we see exactly how to deal with it. Okay, so let me just quickly write the value function. I mean, it's not anything really that interesting here, but uh, basically the value function, right, to so going back to what we had before, just the flow utility plus the discounted expected value function. Okay, so hopefully you've seen at least some dynamics before and you I know this, and this is kind of maximizing again over the vector of consumption, J and X. Um, a very useful thing to write here is not write the full value function, which has in it the state variable, also the stochastic terms, which the agent sees, and we don't. Instead, we actually write what's called the integrated value function. Right? So we basically integrate out over the logit error terms and the Vs, and basically then it, that's what, what, what this looks like. Right? We have this EV function here and the EV function there, and essentially what we've done right, with this uh, um, uh, log of the exponent, we've integrated out the, um, the logit error terms. Right? Remember that inclusive value that we had, that's basically used implicitly in here. And then we're also integrating out this integral here and the part of it that's out, we're integrating over the Vs. And then the final thing that we're taking expectation over here is just the prices. Right? So consumer has to take that expectation over the future prices right, that they don't know. Right, and it's going to be very useful to work in, um, in, this, uh, in this space because it ends up that for the purpose of estimation, that's really the only thing that, um, uh, that we need. And we're going to be looking basically to solve this equation. We're going to look for a fixed point, basically a value of this EV that sort of goes both on the left-hand side and, and in here that, um, um, that kind of uh, uh, equate, if you want. Okay? Now, the key problem here, right, in sort of doing this, so this is all, if any of you have sort of seen, you know, um, um, you know John Rust's work and, and Ariel's work kind of, uh, kind of in the mid-80s on, um, uh, on patents, um, this is all kind of almost sort of standard from there. The thing that's complicated or difficult here is implicit in here, and that is the state, right? So if you look at these are the state that we have to solve for, uh, this, at least at this level, this is going to be a vector of, uh, uh, of J inventories, right? And prices here, and potentially anything, I just assume prices are the only thing that's evolving, but if advertising or characteristics or anything like that's evolving, that's gonna be in here as well. Uh, and prices, again, it's a whole vector. And it's only today just because it's a first order Markov. Actually, if it was a higher order Markov, I'd have to have lags here as well, right? But even with this first order Markov, you can see I already have two times J state variables, and J could be very large, right? So I have to figure out a way, I mean, how to, I have to figure out a way to reduce this dimensionality, okay? And we're gonna do this in two parts. We're gonna reduce what I call the holdings part, right? So that's gonna be the inventory. So we're gonna make assumptions that are gonna reduce this. Then we're gonna make assumptions that are gonna reduce the prices, okay? And I'm gonna deal with these separately, okay? And just to kind of, uh, uh, kind of look a little bit forward, 
Later on, I'm going to start, put up the exact same problem for a durable good. There, the problem is a little bit different. But I'll show you, in some sense, it's exactly the same problem of sort of holding of you know, the quality of products that you hold, and then your prices or characteristics, your expectations about uh, the future. So it's going to be exactly kind of the same structure. And there's actually going to be a parallel in, in, um, in both his literatures of how we reduce the dimension. So to reduce holding, what we're going to make is we're going to make the following assumption. We're going to make this assumption that the utility that you get is just, you know, uh, I'm kind of abusing notation a bit here because I'm going to use CT and, and VT, just take the arrows off. So, okay, what was once a vector is now a scalar. Okay, and really all that it is, the scalar is just a sum over the components of the vector. Right? So what that's saying is the utility, I don't care which brand I consume. Right? All I care is about the total consumption. Right? And similarly for inventory, my inventory costs are right, just what my total, you know, how many ounces it is that I'm, that I'm holding. Okay? It's not which brand. Okay? So the simplest way to think about this is you know, I'm at the store, I buy whatever brand I want, and uh, I come home and I just, you know, pour it into a barrel. And that barrel is a mixture of, you know, whatever, all the different soft drinks that I ever bought. Right? And at that point, it becomes colorless. Right? I can't actually tell them apart. I'm going to store them together and I'm going to consume them um, together. Right? So remember, if I go back to this here, and that's an important point, right? we have this component here. That's the usual thing that we had in a discrete uh, choice model. So there is going to be differentiation here. Right? These are, if you want, kind of all the X's, really what we're going to do for the application. These are going to be advertising, and that's going to be price. And, uh, so that's going to be kind of all the differentiation, but it's all going to be at the time of purchase. Okay? So at the time of purchase, I really care if I buy Tide or Cheer, you know, if I'm looking at, at, at the laundry detergent. But when I get home, suddenly I don't care. Right? It all goes together. Right? So and seemingly, you could sort of think, well, you know, how do you could have put these two things together? And, um, and the truth is, it, it's, it's actually a little bit hard, because on one hand, you could sort of say, well, this is a very natural assumption. You could say, well, do I really think that, you know, think in the case of laundry detergent. How much I use laundry detergent is going to depend on the brand? You know, probably not, right? I mean, there's whatever needs I have, and, you know, that's what I'm going to use, right? On the other hand, you could say, and laundry detergent is actually well known, it's very highly differentiated. People really care about their laundry. If you actually look at individual level data, most people over a period of two years buy at most three different uh, brands of laundry. Most just buy a single one. Okay? So, you know, the question is how do you reconcile these two things? That's really kind of the key, the key issue. And the modeling kind of has to confront that. Right? So what we're doing here is we're going to say there's somehow kind of this advertising, marketing, they get you to buy something and, and purchase. But when you get home, it doesn't really impact how you do, um, um, how you do laundry. Um, you know, we could relax this uh, uh, somewhat by thinking of, of, um, uh, of segments. So rather than actually saying, OK, I'm going to collapse this to a single scalar, you could say I could, rela you know, I could actually uh, uh, collapse this to a lower dimensional um, vector. So you could say, OK, and if let's say I'm looking at cereals, you could say, you know what, I have you know, two or three types of cereals, okay? one for the adults and one for the kids. And then within the adults, I don't really care if it's cereals or cornflakes or, or what it is right, in terms of consumption. Um, uh, and the same for the, um, uh, for the kids, okay? But I need to kind of reduce that dimension significantly, other this isn't, other this, otherwise this isn't going to work. Okay, so what we've done is we've gone from now having to find this expected value function, right, where we have these two vectors, to so at least now we have a scalar and a vector, okay? Actually, we can even simplify the problem further, not just in terms of dimension. You can actually show that already under the assumptions we made, how much you consume is only a function of how much you bought, so how much your inventory is, but not which brand. Okay? So it's, it's actually it's a, it's a very short, and, uh, short proof. So when, what we can do is we can say, okay, now this EV is still the same state space, but before I was maximizing over C, J, and X. Now I'm only maximizing over C and X. Okay, and that's going to be important later on when we want to simplify the, the estimation. Right? So it means, I mean, it's still the same dimension of the problem, but it's actually a slightly simple problem because I'm maximizing over a slightly different, um, uh, different object. And uh, what's going to fit in here is something that I uh, still haven't defined. is going to be this inclusive value, and I'll get back to that in a second. Yes? It, it, that's going to go through the, the cost function. So the cost function could, for example, say that you know, my cost is infinite above a certain level. Okay? But, um, and in some cases, we'll actually, um, well, in the next model, we'll actually have a similar constraint. Actually, not exactly that, but that's one way to, to enter. 
Okay, so now what we end is we've done we've done two things. A, we reduce the dimension of the uh, of the of the state space, but we've also reduced the dimension of the problem, and you'll see that's gonna you know potentially come and help us later on for the estimation. Okay, so now I'm gonna try and reduce the uh, the state space in prices. Okay, so the key concept here, which I've actually already used on the previous slide, and we've already seen, um, is this uh, inclusive value. Okay, so we've already seen it, but let me just repeat in case you just walked in. So the inclusive value, if these epsilons attribute IID, uh, is, the, um, is defined the following way. So it's the inclusive value from a subset of options, and um, it's the expected utility from that subset um, uh, of options. Now, a key to sort of note here is that this is I specific, okay, this inclusive value. Okay, so it incorporates both, you know, the, the product of kind of the, the product of the choice space, but also the preferences of the individual. Now, this is going to be a natural way to reduce the state space. Remember, part of the problem is say, well, I have to keep track of all these prices and characteristics and how they're evolving. Well, it ends up that, you know, if you want to know kind of what's going to be my utility in the future, right? So if I'm sort of thinking, well, do I buy today or do I buy tomorrow? All I need to know is kind of what's my expected utility of the, you know, in storable goods, kind of the product. But if you think of, you know, later we'll do it for durables, you might say, how much are products going to improve later on? Okay, how better are they going to be? Well, it, it's, it's kind of a natural way to reduce it because this is going to be my expected utility tomorrow, right? And it's I specific. That's kind of the key here, right? So that's going to be that, that's good, that's going to be an important role and allow us to reduce the things. It's just a, um, and it's going to play two roles. First is we're going to, it's going to allow us to basically say that the expected utility depends only on the statistic. But in order to really simplify the problem, we're going to have to add an assumption, which I'm just going to add on the next slide, which is something about the transition probability. So I need both of these assumptions or we are reduced the dimension of the problem. Yes, yes, absolutely right. Yes, so if there's segments, you're absolutely right. What I would need, so you'll see in a second, I haven't actually told you how I'm going to do this, but that's exactly what, um, um, uh, what I would need, right, at least in terms of the, uh, um, the dimension, okay? Um, we can, let me, sorry, I'm just looking here. I thought I actually had a discussion here. Did I? Can I skip it or? Oh, you. Uh, so uh, at this point, yes, it can. Sorry, it, at this point, I actually haven't made any assumptions. So UI is still indexed by I, and it can depend on the individual characteristics. Not product attributes. Uh, not product attributes. Now, if I think that there is one potential product that's you know attribute that's important. You know, I could maybe try to kind of pull it out, right? Um, well, what I well, yeah, I'd have to think how that would work here because um, uh, one. So you're you're saying, yeah. So I've told you, okay, if you're going to do this in segments, right? So segment you can think of as an attribute. Now the question: Could I allow for a continuous? Um, uh, a con you know, a single, a one-dimensional continuous, um, 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 I might, I mean, but it's, um, it's not obvious to me right now that I could. So it's segment, so if it's something discrete, yes, I could. Okay, so if the characteristic is discrete, like a segment, or, um, you know, so I separate, you know, is it, let's say, you know, is it, if it's detergent, I could say, okay, there's detergents that I, and that's what I mean actually by segment, detergents that are used for, you know, for colors or, or for whites. Then I could um, uh, I could separate that, but a, a more continuous characteristic uh, I might still be able to do. But um, uh, if I were quicker on my feet, maybe I could figure out how to do it right now. But I'm not 100 percent sure that we could. Okay, but for now that's uh, it's not. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing, by the way, let me. I actually thought I had a slide later that discussed this, but um, um, maybe I'll end up being repetitive. The other thing to think about, you know, just kind of let me kind of say here about the differentiation. You know, one way to think about the differentiation and one way in which you could actually have the characteristics or the specifics is say, well, the utility here, you can think of it as having two components. There's a linear component and a nonlinear component. Now, if I'm willing to assume that, you know, this, there's no discounting or the discounting is minor, uh, I could think of the linear component being brand specific. And then it's actually a way to think about 
what these size are capturing. Okay? So the idea is that if there is a brand specific utility that I get from consumption, and there's no discounting, okay, it's the key here that there's no, uh, no discounting and that it's linear, then basically at any point in time, you know, if I buy 128 ounces of laundry, I can tell you here's how much utility I'm going to get, right? And, and the key here, the reason I, 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 you know, I need that there's no discounting is because it doesn't matter when I consume it, right? And B, um, it, doesn't, it has to be linear, so it doesn't matter, you know, how I consume it, right? It's just a matter of 128 ounces, give me a certain number of utility, and that's in some sense already kind of captured in this psi j. Indeed, if that's the case, what you'd want here, and I'll show you later when we go to the estimates, what you'd want is not psi j x t, but what you want is x times psi j t, or psi j. Okay, so you basically want to say, if I buy a product that's double in quantity, it gives me you know, double the utility under this model. And actually, I'll show you later, we can actually impose that later when we go to the estimation. Okay, so, um, uh, so there is a sense, but again, you know, to do this, I have to have no discounting, and you know, I already have discounting, right? So I basically say that's not exact; it's an it's an approximation, right? So I couldn't, you know, kind of wave my hand a little bit and say, you know, that's what I'm trying to sort of capture here, right? That there's a the nonlinear component of utility that's not brand specific, but the part that's brand specific is um, um, uh, is linear, okay? So I can generalize kind of in that way, okay? And I think the nice thing about that, it actually then kind of tries to explain us. In, at least in these products, what, what's this psi? Where is it coming from, right? Or how is it kind of related to, to this? Okay, um, so uh, let me kind of uh, go back here. So I was uh, basically at the point of saying, okay, we're going to make this uh, um, uh, assumption about the inclusive value, and it's going to help us in two ways. Now we can say the expected utility depends only on that, and something was already in the previous slide. And if I add this assumption, um, assumption A2, which basically says it transitions, Right? So if I, I say, okay, all I need to do is, you know, to compute my utility tomorrow is I need to know what the inclusive value is, what the expected utility is, right? Now, all I, I need to assume now that that distribution, conditional on the whole vector of prices, right, is the same as if I only condition on today's inclusive value, right? So in other words, if I take two vectors of prices, that are identical, sorry, that are different, but yield the same inclusive value, right? The transition to next period is going to be the same, right? Now that's, that's a real assumption, okay? It's gonna be some bite. Luckily though, um, um, and, and by the way, it's a strong assumption for two reasons. First is the first order Markov assumption. You could say maybe it's a higher order Markov. That I can actually relax by just adding more lag. Right, so even in the original thing, it should be PT and PT minus one, uh, and there it should be higher orders. But the other component is the fact that I can, you know, just, just all I need is this lower dimensional vector. Now it ends up, and I'll show you later, uh, if you're willing to buy my assumption A3 that we'll get to, I can actually do this in some sense offline, and I can actually test it. Right, so I can actually play around and sort of see what do I need to predict these different transitions and throw different things at it, so I can actually relax this a little bit by saying not just inclusive value, I'm going to have a few other things. And by the way, this inclusive value here is a vector because there's an inclusive value, one for each size. Okay? So there isn't a single one, but there's one for each size, basically, of that, um, uh, of that mass. So uh, the bottom line is, so I went basically from the fact that I had, you know, two vectors of, you know, two j-dimensional vectors, to now I have, you know, a scalar plus a vector here, that's the number of sizes. Right? And the number of sizes are going to be a much smaller. It's going to be, you know, in the example we look, it's going to be about three or four um, dimensions. So it's, it's still a fairly large state space, right, of basically having four variables in it. Uh, but it's much larger and much more manageable. Okay. So uh, let me talk a little bit about, you know, data identification. And then when I talk about estimation, I'll introduce another assumption that's going to even potentially simplify things further. So uh, the data that we're going to work with is consumer level data. Uh, so it's a little bit actually similar to the, the home scan data, although it's actually a different type of data. So it's, again, it's consumers that are followed over time. Uh, the advantage of this data is you also have the store level data with it. You can actually match up with prices. Um, um, but again, you know, these are kind of scanner data that people kind of tell you um, everything that they buy. Uh, let me, I'm not going to say a lot about identification. Uh, I will say that there's no formal proof. Um, uh, we think, you know, we're sort of formally identified, but, you know, we actually haven't sat down and kind of uh, uh, work through the details. 
informally, the way you can think about this is that the, what the parameters are identified from, and here it's really key to have the individual level parameters, is basically from the sequence of purchases. So for example, suppose I see two households that buy, you know, and I see them over a certain period of time, and they buy the total quantity, the same total quantity. Okay? But suppose that the average duration between purchases is different. Okay, so suppose, you know, let's just for, for sake of argument assume that they buy very regular intervals. One of them buys, you know, every two weeks and buy one buys every six weeks. And this is, the key here is to hold the total quantity constant. Right, so what, I'm, what I can infer from that is that the first household that buys every two weeks um, has, you know, a higher storage cost. Right, so that's basically what's going to identify the storage cost, right, is that you want if the average, you know, holding the quantity constant, um, uh, uh, looking at the average duration between purchases. Okay. Similarly, what's going to identify the utility function? Um, that's going to be again kind of a similar exercise, looking not at the average duration but at the variation in duration. So again, it can make kind of a similar argument. Okay. Now, all of this again, I know it's sort of very hand wavy, but um, uh, that's basically um, the idea behind it. Let me just say a word about price endogeneity because we've talked so much about it. Uh, basically, what we're going to um, assume here is really this psi j xt, right, this kind of unobserved component of the brand, is going to be uh, xj, uh, or psi jx, right, so the idea is that we're going to pick it up with a, uh, with a fixed effect. Okay, so we're going to have its individual level data, so we're going to th throw that in there, and then we assume, well, whatever additional variation is just, you know, just because of the sampling that we have the individual. Or if I want to impose this assumption that I was talking before, I'll actually say it's x times CJ, okay? But the idea is that this is going to control for all the price endogeneity, right? So it's not that there isn't, you know, brand endogeneity, it's just that I'm controlling for it uh, by these kind of brand size specific fixed effects, um, okay? The other thing that's actually going to be very important to see any variation in this over time, and that's actually going to be very important, is to include feature and display. So feature and display, for those of you, uh, this is going to be scanner data, so those of you who don't know, the, um, most scanner data have some measure of whether the, the product was um, either featured in you know, those little bulletins that you get home, okay, or was it displayed differently in the store. Okay? Those things are actually very important. They really change uh, um, uh, how much is purchased, and they are correlated with price. So sales tend to happen more when these things are featured and displayed, and we want to control for that. And that's going to be very important, and I'll talk about it later. In principle, you could say, well, could we nest in here you know, some BLP inversion, or you know, think of uh, Ariel's lecture just before lunch, Right, where we sort of talk how to estimate static demand models with consumer data, data with aggregate. In principle, you could, uh, but it's going to be very hard. Okay? Um, prices. Okay? So think of, you know, basically, it's a, think of it as a price index. That's really, that's really all that this is. Right? So the inclusive value, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, a, it's a utility. It's the expected utility, but it's like a price index that's evolving over time. So think if there was just a, just a, second, if there was just a single product, right? what I want to know is what's the probability of, you know, of a sale tomorrow. Right? I'm going to decide if I buy it today, what's the probability of a sale tomorrow? That's, uh, that's what this is. Does that suggest that the, the characteristics of the product are changing over time? They could, but not in this. In, in principle, uh, no, the way that I've set it up, it's actually, so the thing that do change over time here, you know, this, uh, these variables uh, AJT, which in principle could be characteristics, and for the type of product I'm going to talk about here, they don't. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, the main change could be through here, but these here, what they're trying to capture is they're going to try and capture the advertising and display variable. So those are the only things that are going to change. The other things, these Xi JTs, I'm going to say that the characteristics of the brand, they're going to be picked by brand fixed effect. And in some sense, that that's really all that there is. Okay, that's, uh, now when I go to, you'll see kind of later on when we go to other products like uh, camcorders or, or TVs or stuff like that, there you'd want the characteristics to change. Okay, but that's not going to be, I mean, that's, we're going to use the same structure there, but that's going to be in a different setting.
Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I am going to, you know, so I am going to have individual parameters that I'm going to, so this is all going to be parametric distribution of the heterogeneity. Okay, so the extent, it's not, you know, even though at this point everything is indexed by i, but of course, you know, I'm going to, uh, uh, I shouldn't say of course, but I am going to assume some parametric distribution of these and I want to estimate its parameters. Okay, so I am going to basically learn, you know, about, you know, you know, I'm going to look at your time series, but I'm not inclusively going to learn about you just from that. I'm actually going to be doing some pooling across individuals. Yeah. Oh, these are product, sorry, I mean, it, 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 it wasn't clear. These are product, uh, product size fixed effect. Or, okay, so basically, I mean, that's, it's basically either varying at the J and X level. Okay, these are not at an individual level. Okay, so these are not individual fixed effect. Okay, these are going to be product level. Well, A, I for sure need a very long panel, and I'm not sure that's long enough. I don't know. The truth is, I mean, I find this hard enough to do, but yeah, I'll wait here while you do it. It's, uh, I might be waiting for a while. <laughs> so how are we going to estimate the model? So uh, this is, I'm just going to kind of sketch it out, but hopefully you've seen you know, enough of these to kind of at least get the flavor of it. So we're going to follow what, you know, what uh, John Ross has sort of uh, labeled as the nested algorithm. And it's very similar to the ideas that you know, we've done, although kind of at a, a different approach. So there's going to be a search over parameters, and within it there's going to be kind of a, a procedure that's nest, right? Just like in, the, in, in BLP, we search over parameters as an inversion inside. The only thing is here it's not going to be an inversion. We're just going to solve a dynamic programming problem. So the idea is I'm going to guess the value of the parameters. For that, I'm going to solve a dynamic problem. What does it mean? I'm going to look basically for a fixed point in that Bellman equation that I had up there. Right? So I'm going to say the EV that's on the left has to equal to the EV that's inside the integral. Right? I'm going to basically look for a way to, um, to solve that. And there's various computational methods of how I do that that I'm not going to be talking about at all. And then I'm going to um, basically you know, search for a, um, uh, for a parameter um, that maximizes the likelihood um, uh, of the data uh, that does that. Okay, that's the original sort of Rust thing. The truth is we probably should have done this. This is kind of building up, you know, on comments that Ariel made earlier. We probably could have done this within like a method of moments instead of a likelihood framework, but, you know, it just kind of set it up originally as a, as a like. Um, so that's the original Rust idea. We actually have to deal with two potential issues. One is the fact that one of our um, policy variables and one of our state variables are actually unobserved. Because remember, we choose consumption. We don't actually see consumption in the data. We inventory was a state variable. I don't actually see inventory. Um, the way we're going to sort of deal with that is we're basically going to say we're going to start with initial values, initial guess for, for inventory, and then solve the model. And then given the model, you could actually say, well, what's the optimal consumption? Use that to update. And then basically kind of create a sequence if you want. right? So as part of the procedure, we're basically saying, OK, what's the optimal prediction of the model, and we're going to use that to update the state variable. And this is all conditional on a guess. Right? Now, one way you say, well, how do I know that initial guess? Well, uh, we tried a, a bunch of things um, uh, to deal with this. Initially, what we said, oh, we'll just start a guess, and we'll let the model run for a few periods, and not use those initial periods for estimation, and then kind of only use fo following periods. And we do that at the end, and we try different guesses. It ends up actually, the initial guess doesn't really matter that much once you let it run for a few periods. Because basically what happens is very quickly, in some sense, the model kind of takes you, because consumption is endogenous, takes you to where it wants to be. Right? So it basically, if you start with an inventory that's too high, it basically you have this very high consumption. Right? So you can think of it as just basically you're throwing, I don't know, laundry detergent down the drain right? to kind of bring it to reasonable levels. Uh, if you're starting for too low, you just need kind of to get a few purchases until you build up an inventory that's reasonable. So it really didn't matter what, you know, um, as long as it was in reasonable levels, what, it, what initial inventory we started, the results really weren't sensitive uh, to that. Okay, there's alternative uh, things you could do. Recently, you know, uh, there's this kind of EM algorithm that uh, Arcidiacono and Miller proposed could be tried to use here, although I don't know that anyone's actually done that. Okay, the final simplification we're going to do, this still is actually quite a complicated model to estimate, especially if you want to have rich and a lot of parameters in it. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and split the likelihood. Okay. So the likely what we're going to try to predict is which brand you choose and then which size you're going to choose. Okay, so which brand of detergent and think of a size here. I'm going to think of which you know which box, but you can also think of how many boxes, right? Because it could be that basically that's the dimension which long 
your story. But we're going to think of it as which size, because in the data we're going to look at, that's going to be the key. Um, and so we're going to split, and I'll show you in a second what the justification. We're going to split it into three steps estimation. The first is going to be a static uh, conditional logit. Okay, so it's going to be a logit kind of at the individual level data with all the demographics and, and everything in there, right? So it's kind of the type of logit that Ariel showed us kind of when he was looking at the micro BLP, right? It's at the micro level with all the demographics in there. And it's going to be conditional on a given size. So basically what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look what size you bought, okay? And in that size, I'm going to say now you're only considering options of that size. Okay, and I'll show you in a second how I justify that, okay? But I'm just telling you now what we do, right? So I'm going to estimate that conditional logic, right? So I'm going to look at what you bought, and then I'm just going to look at what are the, what are the, which brand you bought conditional on the size. You only consider options of that size, okay? Um, that's going to be first step. And it's going to end up that I'm going to be able to estimate almost all the parameters that way, right? Kind of the advertising and display and all these fixed effects and everything that way. Then I'm going to use that to estimate this inclusive value. Okay, that's what I need to compute, right? I need all these kind of parameters to, com um, uh, to compute that. And then I can estimate the transitions. Okay, and this is done, right? This is static, right? It's very easy to do. I did it in Stata. This again, I can actually, once I compute these inclusive values, again, I can actually do outside. And this is where I can explore to say, okay, you don't like this particular restriction that I have. I can throw, you know, higher order lags in here to see if it, they help predict. I can actually try to add more variables in it. And it ends up actually they had very little predictive power. But it's actually very simple to add those, at least kind of as an exploration. And then finally, I'm going to do this dynamic problem that I showed you. But this is where what I'm going to do, the dynamic problem is only going to be at the, the choice of the size. So it's whether you purchase or not, and then what size you purchase. So it's not which brand, but just the quantity decision. Okay? So that's what we're going to try to do here. Now, I think this actually captures a very intuitive idea in which you think that the dynamics, the really important dimension is how much you buy. And the brand dynamics, at least you know, in, this pro in this problem, the brand, that's not really a dynamic decision. Okay, I'll now formally show you what we need to assume beyond what we've already assumed for this to work. And it's the following. We basically have to put restrictions on the unobserved heterogeneity. Right? So basically we have to assume that the distribution of these alpha i's and beta i's, right, these are all these parameters of the utility, right? Think of the, the random coefficients, right? In the, in the utility, we're going to have to assume that their distribution um, uh, is the same whether I condition on the size purchased or not, right? Or in other ways, what I want is to say that the, which size I purchase does not give me any information about the distribution of these random coefficients, right? Because if it does, I have a selection problem. Right? So the simplest way to deal with this is to say there are no random coefficients, right? It's basically all observed demographics, right? There are none of, you know, kind of using, you know, Ariel's notation with all these Z's and, and none of these news or, you know, using minor the, the, the demographics that are observed and none of the unobserved stuff. But remember, I can actually have a very rich model and in principle, in some of what we do, and this is actually goes back to uh, your question, uh, um, uh, in principle, what we're going to do is we're actually going to have household brand fixed effects. Okay, and we're going to you know, allude to some you know, idea that we have a long enough panel that we can actually estimate that. Okay, so, but, and we can do that because we've kind of made this assumption. Yes? Yeah, I'll get back to the effective price here. In this, in this model, in some sense, it's the, um, I, mean, I, I mean, implicit in here, it's not just my price, it's my expectation about future price, so that's really the effective price. No, but that's right here, it's a condition on ads, and right. then it looks at this brand and based on current price. The effective price method becomes quite new, which is why I'm a bit confused. Right, but let me ask you kind of to put that aside. I mean, I can talk to you about, you know, later. But the key here issue is the fact that the dynamics are going to enter in this step. So the effective price or, you know, the dynamic price, where it's going to matter, it's going to matter for uh, how much I choose. But it ends up that, you know, if you buy my assumptions that basically the conditional on the size. So now you've decided I'm going to buy, you know, 50 ounces of detergent. Okay, or I'm going to buy, you know, uh, uh, you know whatever, uh, 24 rolls of toilet paper. Okay, which brand you choose, that's going to be a static decision if you buy 
you know, if you buy my assumptions, right? So the dynamics are only going to enter, and the effective price is only going to enter in this choice, in this, in, in, in this prob part of the problem. And the way it's going to enter here is because I have an expectation about future price. So I haven't really defined an effective price here yet. Um, and I'm not going to, in this model, it's going to show up kind of in the next model. Here it's kind of implicit. But here the key is the fact that I can really separate, right? So this decision, it's not dynamic, okay? Which I think is an intuitive idea, although, you know, you might not necessarily like the, the assumptions that I have to do in order to, uh, to get to it, okay? So, so anyway, which, uh, once I have this um, additional assumption, which obviously, you know, restricts the unobserved heterogeneity, um, um, I can actually estimate, you know, this first step, have this split. So really there's a big trade-off here between, you know, split speed, and this is not just speed in the sense of like, oh, I can save, you know, a few minutes on my computation. It also is because I can have a much richer model. Because if I wanted to solve the full model, there's only so many variables that I can actually, you know, maximize over just because, you know, as Ariel said yesterday, it's exponential in the cost. While here I can have a model with actually hundreds of parameters, including, you know, all these fixed effects and, and various uh, uh, other variables, Right? Um, um, so I can make it a much richer model on the observed part, but I have to give up on the unobserved part, right? So that's kind of the trade-off uh, uh, that we're facing. Okay? Now the truth is, again, we can estimate it without this assumption, but, you know, we'd be somewhat limited. Okay, so let me just quickly show you a, a few results. I mean, I'm not going to show you the full thing, but, yes? I am estimating it separately. Uh, that's actually the one slide I didn't put in here. Um, so, um, uh, um, I mean, it's a bit hard to say as kind of what it looks like. I mean, I can't tell you, I forget exactly, like, so if I, um, if I look, you know, each of these inclusive values, I'm going to have, you know, four of these for, I, uh, four, I forget, three or four for each of the sizes. And so I regress each one of them on the other. Uh, and uh, remember, the inclusive values are going to be individual specific. The process, I'm going to do some pooling across. I'm going to divide the household based on their characteristics to like uh, uh, six different bins, depending on you know, whether they live in an urban area, a suburban area, and on their sizes. So I'm going to have a different process for each of these. So it's about 50, 60 households for each of these. Uh, so just, just regressing that, just a linear regression of you know, the inclusive value tomorrow as a function of the inclusive values today, those three or four. I get an R square of about 60, 70 percent. Uh, we tried throwing in, so throwing in additional lags adds very little explanatory power. Okay. So it enters through the omega. So basically what it means is, you know, um, it's, it's a utility, so it's the inverse of it. So when, in a period, if I'm in a, so you can think of it, if it was just a single product, I would literally get that sales, you know, factor. But it basically smooths it out, right? Because it's now averaging, or not averaging, it's kind of aggregating over a bunch of products. Right, so it basically, if you think, I mean, I didn't actually, you know, you don't see it as much in the time series, but you basically, the time series you see is that it's, you know, there's periods when nothing's on sale, and then there's periods, you know, when, something else on sale, and if it actually ends up that, you know, let's say it's not your products on sale, a product you don't care about, um, you know, so your omega isn't going to go up. But if it's a, it's a product that, you know, let's say Bob does care about, it, it will, you know, uh, it will go up. So it's basically a smooth version of that, you know, that sale. That's the way that I think of it. It's, it's not really if I see utility in it, right, because I never converted it to dollars, but that's really what it's trying to see. It's trying to tell you what's your expected utility tomorrow. Right from this whole bundle of uh, of goods. Yes. The inclusive value here is sort of where you want to tell the status of the overall. But if you look at the silicon merger policy, again, the gross model, do you think the same thing is just really going to go? It's no longer going to be useful sort of mechanically, rather. Let Let me show you what I. So I I agree with you that you know. Um, there is going to be an issue. I mean, so I think a big issue of using all of this, forget for a second the estimation, is the fact that if we want to use this for mergers, so I told you, oh, here's the bias and demand estimates. But in some sense, you know, if I'm going to plug this into like a first order condition coming out of a static pricing, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. Right? So in some sense, I need to solve the dynamic supply. So that's exactly our motivation in this, uh, what I call the simple demand model. So I'm going to get to that next. 
Okay, but you're absolutely right in the sense that it's, you know, I'll show you some, you know, the next slide is going to be about uh, uh, biases, but, you know, and I'm going to tell you what that does if you were to do merger analysis, but it's merger analysis in a static framework, and you say, well, why should I do static here? But, okay, I'll get, I'll get to that in just, uh, in just a second, and it's a very good question. Okay, so let me just show you here, this is the first step of the estimation. This is the conditional, uh, cho the, the, which brand I choose conditional on size. And remember, because it's a static, I mean, I can throw, you know, the kitchen sink into this, really. I mean, it's really, it's, the restrictions now is the data, it's not the computation. Um, so uh, I'll just build up gradually and try to show you. So here we just ran, this is essentially just price. Uh, and you get, you know, a certain price coefficient. Uh, now what we're going to add is brand dummy variable. Okay, so once again, this whole issue that, you know, once you go to individual level data, there's still some endogeneity and you want to control for brand and you see it goes in the way that we expect. The price coefficient doubles in absolute value. Okay? Um, the thing that we do next, though, is we actually are going to put feature and display in here, still with brand dummies. Okay? And now the price coefficient actually goes down. Actually, interestingly, it ends up going down to exactly where the, kind of the, um, not the OLS, it's maximum likelihood uh, was, so without actually these additional controls. Uh, and the reason this happens, right, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it's something that we forgot that actually, you know, endogeneity can push you in different ways. Really, what happens here is whenever price, whenever there's a sale, they also promote it a lot. And the question is, is it coming from the price reduction or is it coming from the advertising effect? And to do that, you need to control to basically say, okay, I want to look at the cases where there was only a price reduction without advertising. Right? And once you do that, you actually get a, low, a, low, a lower response. Right? When I didn't control for it, everything was loaded on price. But it ends up that once you control for it, and this is where it's important because you know, if we wanted to actually do this in a dynamic model, so other people have uh, proposed uh, you know, similar problems for this or similar models for this where they didn't do the splits, but they couldn't actually add, for example, feature and display. And it ends up that's going to be almost more important than everything else that we do. Okay, and, and it's kind of intuitive, right? It, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, if you, if advertising is correlated, you want to separate the advertising effect from the price effect. Okay, so that's going to be important. The rest of these columns, they kind of explore um, various things like adding demographics, and you see, you know, these next columns do. Uh, now what I'm going to try to do is, you know, these were brand dummy variables just at the brand level. Now I'm going to start interacting them with individual characteristics, right? Going back actually to your question of heterogeneity. So first I just, uh, uh, um, look at, um, um, it interacted with demographics. Uh, I forget what demographics we put in here. And you see that doesn't do much in terms of the coefficients that we care about. But of course, you know, there will be heterogeneity here. Next, we're going to try and actually interact it with size to get at this effect of things. And you can see, um, uh, you can see the effect here. And then we kind of, you know, do a whole bunch of basically, we get to the point where we're looking at brand household dummy variables. So we look for each household because they're choosing a very small number of brands over this time period. It's actually not that many fixed effects per household. And we actually have, you know, it's, it's a weekly data for two years. So we have a, you know, uh, we have a fairly long panel, so we can actually do that. Um, we do set basically, uh, yeah, so that's basically what, um, what we do here. From here, we compute the inclusive value, and then we estimate this process, which I probably should have shown you and kind of shown you what it looks like. But it basically looks like a smooth version of that, you know, the prices. So you don't get as much of a, you know, the sale or the jumps. But there is kind of that sort of similar uh, pattern of things um, uh, evolving uh, over time. So let me just show you one set of numbers here. It's actually, I cut and paste this table and kind of realized it came out funny. So what this table shows you, this is the ratio of the short run elasticity, or not short run, the elasticity is computed from the static model, right? If I basically just did like the same things I did in the previous table, okay? But now included all the choices and got a price coefficient from that. Um, uh, divided by the long run elasticity that you get from the dynamic model. Okay, and what we have here is we have, it's for 128 ounces of laundry detergent over different brands. And here, what, you know, what's cut off in the different columns, again, are different sizes and different brands. Okay, so you can see in each column, there's the, you know, the one number that's over one. That's the own price elasticity for that size of that brand. And you can see it's you know, 123, 142, 1.2. Here it's actually 0.9. Uh, one four, uh, uh, 144 and uh, uh, 129 for the private label, okay? So roughly, if you average that, it means that it's about 30% higher. So the, stat the, the estimates from the static demand are about 30% higher than those from the long run estimates from the dynamic. Okay, that's the own price. Yes, exactly. So I basically say, let's change price and keep it 
you know, keep it constant. The way we did that in the model is we said whatever the price process was, whatever the sales were, we kept that same trend and we just shifted it all up, let's say by 10 cents. Okay, so we just kept that whole, um, uh, that whole trend. And there's different ways you can do that. Maybe they make different things, but we thought that was the most reasonable way to do it. Let, let me get let, let me get it maybe in a second to that. Okay, um, the other thing that we have here these are all the cross price elasticities, and you can see they're actually you know way below one, right? I mean on average they're about I don't know I mean just kind of roughly looking about twenty percent or so. So you actually see the larger effect is the one on the cross price and not on the own price. Now if you actually wanted to use this like let's say for mergers, kind of going back to to your question, just plug it into a static. Man, you could say, well, why should I apply in a static pricing equation? Well, that's because what, that's what we know how to do. Okay, that's the best answer I have. Not a good one, but that's the best I have. Uh, they both would work in the same way because if you think of diversion ratios, which is usually what we care about, right? I mean, they're both going. Diversion ratio is the cross over the own, right? And basically, what it will tell you is that static static models uh, would think that the competition is much less than it really is. In principle, really, the only cross that's actually higher, by the way, I didn't emphasize, is the outside good. And it sort of makes sense, right? Because people aren't buying that frequently, right? They typically buy every five or six weeks, right? So there's fairly high substitution in the static model to it. But the dynamic model, one could even say in laundry detergent, there is no substitution to the outside good, right? I mean, it's not, it's not like I'm going to stop buying or buy less, right? I mean, uh, you might buy a little bit less or a little, little bit less detergent, a little bit less laundry, but not, not that much, right? So that's really where it's all coming from. The static saying there's a lot more substitution to the outside good. Um, than the dynamic models. Dynamic models say you really there's you know products are much closer in characteristic space or in, in competition. Therefore, you know the effect of a merger in this static framework, if you just kind of look at that that price, will actually be much higher. Okay. Okay. So um, so that that's kind of this um, uh, more complex model. Let me just quickly kind of go you know. Um, um, through the, the simple model, and you know, I'm, I think it's kind of late in the day, so I might not have you know, as much time to go through the full detail, but just give you kind of a little bit of the flavor. And part of it, it's exactly answering the type of questions you want. So let me just set up the motivation and then talk about the specific uh, you want. So, so I think what we've learned is that, you know, neglecting demand dynamics is important and could yield you know, important results, but the estimation, even after all these simplification stuff, was actually quite complex. Okay, I mean, this is you know, something that you know, took us you know, a while to do. We need to do, you know, at the end of the day, I still had you know, um, uh, uh, you know, five-dimensional state space. And I still, you know, it's not, I mean, it was really kind of pushing the, the levels of you know, what we could do. Required consumer level panel, which you know, a lot of times just not there. I mean, you know, we talked about it. Whenever you have it, it's great to use it, but sometimes you just don't have the consumer level data. Uh, and maybe most importantly, is that you know, it's very difficult to derive the supply model. Right? So you say, OK, we have this demand model. Now we want to close it. But you know, I, I, I can go th you know, through this, but I'm not. You know, just even formulating what the right state variables are in that model is actually quite hard. Right? So there's a couple of ways we can, we can go about it. We can sort of say, OK, maybe we shouldn't go to assuming you know, everyone knows everything. But it, it, you know, the usual way we think about it, the full information case, you'd want to actually have you know, some distribution of inventories that you know about. I mean, it gets very complicated very quickly. Right? So we wanted to know is there kind of a, a simpler model that will allow us to do it. And especially you say it's one thing if what you want is to write a paper about demand estimation. right? Then you probably want to do something like that previous paper. But suppose what you want is you want to look at supply. Or suppose it's actually just an input into some other you know, problem that you're really interested in. Right? So then you know, maybe you don't necessarily have the time or the effort. So we were kind of looking to say are there simpler ways look at it. And you know, the simpler things that we explored were saying, suppose you actually aggregate, let's say, over time. So, oh yeah, with this weekly data, I understand. But you know, I used to claim this you know, for my, uh, my job market paper, the, the serial paper. I used to say, well, you know, it's quarterly data. You don't have to worry about uh, storability. And you know, I sort of believed it. But you know, if you think about it, that's, it's hard to actually show that formally. right? When you're working with nonlinear functions, it's not clear that this averaging you know, um, really helps. Right? So we thought, well, let's try to explore that. So that's what we kind of tried to do kind of in this paper that's uh, uh, joint with Eagle Handel. And um, we explored various things. We explored aggregation um, uh, kind of over time. We explored kind of various uh, throwing in kind of various lags of prices and quantities. And we kind of ended up with what we have now, which is some form of adding you know, lags in the model. But it's actually kind of more model driven. So let me kind of try to uh, take you uh, for it. Now the model I'm going to propose to you um, 
It's going to have even in some ways even stronger assumptions than what we had before. But the key to remember is not like before it was model free or assumptions free. Okay, there were a lot of assumptions in here. So, um, um, so the question is, you know, are these how much you know how much stronger are the ones that are in here? Uh, and the key is going to be that we're actually going to be able to estimate it with aggregate data. Okay, and hopefully I'll convince you that it's actually you know it's actually reasonably well identified under our assumptions. Um, and the key to this is going to be the storage technology. Okay, so you'll see what we're going to say instead of you know you have physical units that you can store. It goes a little bit to the idea that is there a cap on how much you can store? What we're going to put here is we're going to put a cap on the number of periods that you can store, right? Which in some sense is a funny assumption, but it's going to buy us a lot, right? So at least you know if you're going to make a strong assumption, at least make you know make sure you get something for it. And I hopefully we're you know we're going to get enough here that you're willing to to live with that. And as a result, what happens is going to make the supply side tractable. I'm not going to have any results from the supply model, but actually that's what this paper, um, that's what this paper does. We've actually now solved the supply side. And we can show you what that looks like. Okay, so let me just kind of outline the model. You know, there's a lot going on here. Even though it's a simple model, it's, uh, um, it, it, there's nothing complicated, but it's just a different way of thinking that it always you know, takes a while to, to understand. So we're going to make basically three assumptions uh, on heterogeneity, on storage, and about expectation. Right, which effectively we had also before. So on heterogeneity, we're going to make the following assumption. We're going to assume there's going to be two, two consumer types. And the simplest version of the model assumes that there's a, a proportion of them, omega, that just does not store. Okay, so there's a proportion, one minus omega, that stores. You know, if they find it profitable, but at least consider storing. And there's a proportion, omega, that just never stores. So think that their costs, you know, they live in you know, studio apartments in New York, just can't store. Okay, that's the, that's the way to think of it. Now, ideally, what you'd like is you'd like to have this endogenous, right, depending on the prices. Okay, but for now, we're just going to take this as an exogenous variable. That's assumption one. Assumption two, which I think is the critical one, is the fact that inventory is going to be free. There's not going to be a cost of storing inventory, but it can last for only T periods, right? So it's free until it expires, right? So if you think of, you know, perishable products, that really fits this assumption. Right? But we're going to make this assumption for Coke that has a shelf life of, I don't know, two, three years. Okay? Not as long as Twinkies, but, you know, but longer than what we're going to have here. Um, right? But we're going to make this assumption that it's only going to store, and T here is going to be for a lot of our work is just, you know, is going to be one, right? So one period. So you can buy today, and you have to consume it tomorrow. We can extend it for longer T's, but, you know, at some point it actually becomes non-tractable. Okay? So it's a very strong assumption. If there's one that you should object to, it's this one. Okay, but I'll show you what we're going to get from it, and we're going to get a lot. I mean, it's going to really almost borderline trivialize the problem. Uh, and then the third uh, is we're going to make an, uh, an assumption about expectation. The simplest one I'm going to work with is about it's for, uh, perfect foresight of future prices. I can also work with rational expectations. Model, it gets a little bit more complicated, okay, but it's still workable. Okay, so a lot of people actually object to this more than the second one, but actually it ends up, you know, this one is the one we can relax, and that's why I'm actually emphasizing the second one, because I really do think that's the one that, you know, I can relax almost anything. That one, you know, if you don't let me have, that's, you know, maybe I can fudge it a little bit, but not, you know, that's where things are really going to fall apart. Okay, so let me just go through this quickly. Um, each, each, each type of consumer is either those that store or those that don't store have a separate utility function. Okay, so it's again, it's a quasi-linear. Uh, notice here that it's indexed by T, so later when we go to the empirical estimation, that's kind of where the error term is going to be, right? So I'm going to parameterize something that's constant plus an error term uh, to the demand. Absent storage, so if we couldn't store, there was no reason to store, these are going to be the, what I'm going to call the consumption functions, right? So these are, if you want, the static demand. I mean, I, you know, be a little bit sort of careful here, right? So if there's no storage, this is what the demand functions would look like. Right? And its Q is going to be the consumption. Okay? Now I'm going to denote uh, purchases by X. Remember, I have to separate between the two. Okay. Well, what do the purchasing patterns look like? And here you'll see this is the power of this, uh, uh, of this assumption. Let me do it under T equals 1, right? which means this is going to be weekly. So I can buy today, and I hate to, uh, whatever I buy today, I can either consume today or consume tomorrow. But after that, it perishes. So I have to consume it. Okay, well, it ends up that, and I'm going to do this, let's say, for, let's start with a single product, and then I'll see how we add others. This is where the effective price is going to come in. So with a single product, I basically have um, four states. You know, that I'm going to denote, you know, SS, NN, NS, and uh, uh, NS, and SN. I, uh, there's a typo there. Where the first letter refers to 
whether there was a sale or not yesterday. So n is no sale, s is sale. And the second one is to whether the one's today, right? So this is no sale yesterday, no sale uh, today. Okay, so what am I going to purchase? So um, the non-stores, they're always just going to purchase, you know, the kind of the static demand, right? That's easy. But how about the, uh, how about the stores? Well, the stores, they basically, in each period, they're thinking, do I buy for today? And do I buy for tomorrow? And in each of these states, that's going to be different. So let's start with these two states where there was no sale yesterday. Well, in both those periods, I'm going to buy for today. Okay? So that's this component. Okay? Uh, in, this, in this case, there's no sale today, so I'm only going to buy for today. No need to buy for tomorrow because there's no sale. Why should I buy? Okay? Similarly, um, uh, here in this state, there's a sale today, so I'm going to buy for tomorrow. Okay, now, you know, we have in this model, there's perfect foresight, so you might ask, well, if I know there's a sale tomorrow, why don't I buy, wait till tomorrow? So we're just going to add, if you want, a tiny little bit of noise or a tiebreaker, because I'm indifferent, and I'm going to say, well, you know, um, if there's a sale today, even, even if I expect that there's a sale tomorrow, I still buy today, just on the off chance that maybe I can't make it to the store. Okay? So, the, you know, so in both of these periods, or both of these states, I'm going to buy for today. In this state, I'm also going to buy for tomorrow. How about the states where there was a sale yesterday? Well, if there was a sale yesterday, I already bought for today, so I don't need to buy for today. That's these two zeros. Okay? If it's not a sale today, I'm not going to buy at all, because I'm not going to buy for tomorrow. If there is a sale today, I will buy for tomorrow. Okay? So that's kind of the consumption, think of it, of, of Coke. How does the price of Pepsi enter into here? Well, here what I have is the effective price, and this goes back, and the effective price of Pepsi is basically the minimum of, you know, of Pepsi's price yesterday and Pepsi's price today, or Pepsi at T minus 1 and T. And note that the effective price is a little bit different in both of these cases. Right? So when I bought, you know, when I buy, let's say, for today, you know, the effective price of Pepsi is the either today's price or yesterday's price. Because it could have been that Pepsi was on sale and I bought you know, yesterday for Pepsi, or it could have been today. But basically, the effective price, the fact that I'm taking the minimum here, takes care of that. Okay? And when I'm buying for tomorrow, the effective price is either today or tomorrow's price of Pepsi. Okay? So what's nice here is that A, I get this very simple structure of what I buy today, but it also gives me this idea of, you know, how do I take care of all the other products? It's all through this effective price. Right? So you know, I'm, I'm going through this quickly, but you know, uh, I think you'd all agree this is significantly simpler than the Bellman equations that I had up there uh, before. Okay, so let me just quickly say something about the assumptions, and then uh, I'll kind of uh, uh, try to conclude, because even though I have 50 more minutes, I think we're it's getting a bit late. It's uh, a bit heavy for uh, uh, quarter to five. So, um, so A1, you know, this was this assumption of splitting. So again, you could sort of see it as, a, as an assumption on the storage cost. In principle, we could actually make this fraction a price, you know, a fraction of the price P, and then it's kind of more endogenous. Uh, we could do that. I mean, you know, the, the, the issue is we want a simple model, right? So it's very easy to make this model more complicated, and you have to ask, is it worth that complication? The storage technology, that's something we really need. But as you saw, it really, it really allows us to simplify the state space because there's these no leftovers to carry. And it really detaches, you know, through this effective price, um, uh, the other product. It's easier to allow for larger T. And it's also easier to allow, this goes back to kind of basically A1. I could actually, here I have stores and non-stores. I could also have, you know, people that store for zero period. Those are non-stores. Those that store for one, for two, for three periods. So I can actually allow for heterogeneity along those dimensions, especially if it's fixed proportion. And then, you know, in terms of the A3, perfect, you know, perfect force is much easier to work with. But it ends up, you know, I'm not going to go through it, but rational expectations is doable as well. Okay. Um, you know, I'm going to skip this, but if you kind of ask, well, how are we going to estimate this from aggregate data? Well, it ends up that, you know, if you kind of go through the, the accounting of the states, and that's kind of what I go through here, it actually allows you to, you know, to recover these actually non-parametrically. And that's, you know, uh, I can go through this, you know, if anyone's interested, you come up later. But really, once you start thinking of these states, you can really see, you know, there's a, you know, one state where only the stores purchase, and I basically the difference between, you know, those two states recovers that, and then, I kind of unravel. So it's actually, you know, we don't have a formal proof, but actually here I think the formal proof is not that hard to write. We basically, we talk through it in words in the paper, but um, uh, I could go. So I really do think the model here is actually non-parametrically identified, which I'm actually not sure. It is non-parametrically identified with store-level data. 
Um, and actually, in some sense, it's over-identified if there's some overlap in what, what's considered a sales price. So I, I, it's kind of a subtlety I don't want to go into, but there's actually different prices can be sales or not, depending on what your expectation is about the future. And in that range, actually, the model is even over-identified. Okay, and the same idea extends for more products than with t equals 1. Uh, we estimate this basically, it's, um, it's nonlinear estimation for things that I'm not going to go into, but this is actually all done in Stata. Uh, we're going to estimate this using um, uh, OLS, but you could also use IVs on it, right? So it's basically the whole work here is how to formulate the, um, um, the demand model. Uh, here, by the way, when I say we estimate, we're actually going to have a very simple uh, 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 demand model in product space, right? So it's just going to be kind of a log log. Um, um, a log linear demand model uh, of just, you know, Coke on the price of Pepsi and uh, of Coke, Pepsi, and the, the generic brand. But we could, in principle, we're actually working on this, extending this to a BLP um, uh, framework, uh, but we're not going to uh, do this. Okay. Um, so just quickly, demand for colas. We estimate this using scanner data. This is the uh, regression that we, um, uh, we look at. Um, you know, I'm not going to sort of dwell on these numbers. The key thing, and partly what we want to show here, is to show, uh, and this is kind of to feed this into the supply side, is we want to actually show that the heterogeneity between the stores and non-stores this goes for the motives for sale. And it ends up that the stores are significantly more price sensitive. Okay? And that's the key for, for kind of, you know, wanting to price discriminate. Right? So it ends up, you know, that the stores are more price sensitive, so you actually want to kind of skim them out, and um, the demand model kind of lines up with that. And indeed, once we put it through the profit, it actually is profitable to do. Okay? So I, I went through this quickly, but just to kind of outline, let me just sort of spend literally five minutes or even less on durable goods. Um, it ends up, you know, that durable goods end up, they're very similar to storable goods, although the problems that arise in these markets are very different. But I don't think it's because of the nature of the product. It's because of the nature of the pricing that you face. So in storable goods, what you see is you see this temporary price reduction. In durable goods, what you see, and this is actually something Ariel talked about at the end of the day yesterday, in many of these things, what you see is a declining prices over time. Right? So the real problem is, do I buy today or wait till tomorrow when the quality adjusted prices are going to be higher? Because right? I'm going to get either lower prices or higher quality, or, or both. Right? So that's the real kind of dynamic issue here. Um, but in terms of actually the modeling, it ends up there's almost a one-to-one -one, uh, modeling. And in principle, we could have actually written this in kind of one one framework, and I'll try to show you it in a little bit. The implications for demand estimation, well, it really depends whether you have repeat purchases or not. So if there's no repeat purchase, so if I buy a durable good and I'm off the market, then the problem is that the static model, um, you need to account for the change in distribution of consumers. So the idea is, right, that you're, you're, you're getting off, you know, some of the consumers, probably the least price sensitive ones, right, if the price is declining, you're getting them off the market, right? And that's what would go wrong if you just did a static demand estimate is the fact that you know, your distribution of heterogeneity you're holding constant, but unless there's you know, refreshment of, con and it has to be refreshment of exactly the right type, you're actually going to be skimming off, right? There's a selection problem kind of as you move along. Um, the other thing that you're missing in the stack model is the option value of waiting, right? So you're missing that because you, know, you might not be buying today because you say, oh, you know what? I'll wait for, for tomorrow, and the static model has no way of capturing that. With repeated purchase, so if basically what you're saying is consumers buy and then they're back on the market, uh, you're not, you're not, you know, it's still the distribution stays constant, but what you're not accounting for is, again, this, you know, expectation, but maybe more importantly is the fact that the outside good is changing, right? So what could happen is, you know, think of, of a new car. You could say, well, I'm on the market every year for a new car, but, you know, my outside option, if I just bought a new car, is pretty high, right? So you have to give me a really good, you know, either a really great option, um, uh, or really good price to get me to drop that, right? And that's kind of missed in the kind of static, static models that we have. Okay. Um, what are the the examples? So you know, I'm going to skip this, but you can actually, and this is a simple example where you say there's just a you know uniform willingness to pay, and you kind of you know prices just decline in a kind of uniform way along this. And static demand, there's just constant, uh, you know, you're basically selling you know a constant number of units all the time, and you think well you don't care about price, but in reality you do. So let me just. Um, Skip that. Um, okay, so um, basically, you know, um, if you want, this is kind of the, um, um, you know, the problem that you have here. And let me just sort of see. It's basically the whole issue is the fact that 
you know, your outside option is changing, right? Because that's what you purchased last time. And that's kind of the main, the main thing that's um, the changing. It ends up that in terms of reducing the state space, you can do the same type of things um, that uh, we did uh, before. The key difference here is that here when you do this inclusive value, um, you actually have to define what I'm calling the dynamic inclusive value. So what I mean by that is the dynamic inclusive, right, before it was just a price index, right, just basically the utility. Now, in order to, with repeat purchase for this to work, you need to also include the expected value, right? So now it's not just a price index, it actually has an endogenous component of the consumer's decision problem, right? So even though you could say, oh, it's the same type of assumption about the inclusive value, it's actually a very, I think it's actually a much stronger assumption because before we were just making an assumption about the supply side, the evolution of the supply side. Here, built into this inclusive value is some dynamic behavior of the consumer. Okay, but you know, if you're willing to buy that, the restrictions are actually kind of uh, similar. Yes? You know, I wonder if it's the worst here with the supply side, because now it really is not the same thing in the sense that the users would want to start paying more than each other at home. So it seems like there's these notions. Yeah, I mean, you could say, uh, I'm happy to buy that, you know, because I've worked on the storable side, but I actually, just for fairness, I think, you know, we have a similar problem with storable, because you might, they might want to game it as well and put product on sale and coordinate and stuff, so. It's much shorter. Yeah, yeah, but I agree. But the main thing that kind of, you know, that I think differs here is the fact that this inclusive value also includes the optimal behavior of the, the consumer, and then you kind of think, well, what does it mean to now sort of assume it evolves in certain to, uh, according to some exogenous process like we did before? Yeah, no, no, I agree. Um, but, but anyway, so that's, you know, in this kind of literature. But otherwise, it's actually, you know, the similar of the restrictions of the holdings that we had before, right, of this, the, the inventories. The similar here is the fact that you're actually, even though when there's repeat purchases, you're only actually holding a single product. So when I repurchase, I basically throw away the old one. And because otherwise, I'd have to have a whole vector. I mean, think of cars. I'd want to have a whole vector of, you know, what are the cars that I hold, as opposed to I just hold a single car. Right, so there's a similar kind of assumption here, right? So that's a sense in which the, the problem's actually very similar. I think what's different is really the price process that you face, uh, uh, and that kind of changes uh, the dynamics. So I think in the storable goods, right, if, if they were constantly evolving, you could almost think of it like a, you know, kind of almost like a durable goods problem. Um, actually, here you can estimate this with individual level data or consumer level data, um, uh, sorry, uh, consumer level or uh, market level data. Um, let me kind of skip, you know, the detail. Let me just sort of say, so the paper that does this is a paper by um, Gautam uh, Garasankan and uh, Mark Reisman. They study camcorders, and um, they actually estimate this using market-level data. So what they do, uh, and let me just sort of say as a, as a short word, they basically take and, you know, just like in the previous paper, we took the dynamic programming problem and embedded it inside a likelihood. Think of doing the BLP model, right? So the BLP, there's, there's two nests, right? There's a search for parameter and an inversion. Now think of there's an, a third nest inside the inversion, which is actually solving a dynamic programming problem, right? So think of a, you know, a nested within, you know, a dynamic programming problem nested within an inversion, nested within a search over the parameters, okay? Uh, way beyond my computational ability, but you know, you know, you know, if anyone can do it, Gautam can, and, and he did. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, that's what they did here. Let me just show you sort of quickly Numbers, so these are numbers from uh, um, uh, four different models. Basic dynamic model, that's you know, basically a model uh, that they like. This is without repurchases, and that's a dynamic model with micro moments. Because we're in the BLP world, you can do you know, everything we do is static, with and without micro moments. Uh, and, and then they have the static model. So think of this like a BLP model applied to camcorders. Um, you can look at various things. Let's just look at price. Um, you can see the effect of price is non-significant in the static world, becomes much more significant uh, or becomes significant in, the, in their base model, actually even slightly more significant when they add the micro moment. So once again, the same lesson that we saw before, the micro moments kind of uh, really help you with, with getting precision because it's actually, they don't change the point estimate as much, but the standard error goes down by, you know, it's about a quarter um, uh, of what it is. And that's kind of a similar pattern that, uh, uh, you grow throughout um, all of this. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop here.
Any last-minute questions? 